Christian. Thank you so thank you so much for coming out. Can you hear me? I'll introduce myself. Hello. <laughs> I'm Charles Danko, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, so an assay that my lab uses a lot is ProSeq, and I don't think I have to introduce it here, but we like it because it gives you really a lot of deep information about what our genomes are actually doing at any particular locus, right? So for example, we can pick out the location of enhancers, uh, promoters, uh, gene bodies, and polyadenylation sites, and we can even measure gene expression by integrating the polymerase in the gene body. So it's a really rich source of genomic data. And among its various applications, one that I've always been really excited about is, um, let's say that you had a case where you have a limited sample and you need to extract as much information about what our genomes are doing from that sample, like a clinical isolate, this would be the tool to use, okay? Um, the difficulty with this, of course, is that conventionally ProSeq requires a nuclear isolation, which can be really challenging to troubleshoot in a solid tissue sample like a brain here. Um, so I've been in the market, as it were, for some time now for a strategy that would let you take the solid tissue sample, put it through a black box of biochemistry, and pull ProSeq data out the other end, okay? So um, the technology that we're using, um, it was uh, thought up by Ho Jung Kwak, um, who's now our colleague at Cornell, when he was a, uh, a graduate student in John Liss's lab. Um, and he, um, uh, uh, what he did was he took a tissue sample and he pulverized it, stuck it in an Eppendorf, and centrifuged out the chromatin, okay? And then he proceeded to the elegant biochemistry of ProSeq. And so we call this strategy chromatin run-on and sequencing, or ProSeq. And this works precisely because a chromatin sample, uh, chromatin prep, is much easier to obtain from a tissue sample than nuclei. Um, so, of course, the natural question to ask is, do you lose any information when you take the strategy? So we took your cat CD4 positive T-cell leukemia line and subjected it to ProSeq and CrowSeq. Um, and the data is shown in the slide here. So ProSeq up at the top, you can see it's very highly correlated with ProSeq data at the bottom. And this is true genome-wide as well. So if you integrate the signal in gene body, you can see that ProSeq and ProSeq produce a correlation in both gene bodies and um, at the PosSeq that we expect from just biological replicates of ProSeq data alone, okay? Um, so this was great, having shown that it works. Um, we next asked if we could apply this in tissue samples that are perhaps harder to analyze using conventional tools. And the most difficult one that we have done it in so far is this archival glioblastoma that was uh, banked in 1988. Um, so it's almost 30 years old. Um, and the first time we ran the assay, we got these short little libraries that are just barely larger than the Illumina adapter. And this is the uh, detailed distribution of insert sizes after sequencing. And you can see a mode of the distribution that's about 20 nucleotides in size. And this corresponds perfectly with exactly the amount of RNA that you expect to be protected from degradation by the polymerase exit channel. So what we think has happened in this case is that the RNA in the sample is completely degraded but we can still get a signal based on RNA that, um, that is protected from degradation. So this is great, um, but 20 nucleotides is not really enough to map in mammalian genomes to make sure you're not um, missing something. So the um, uh, Ed Rice, who's the um, excellent, excellent hands in my lab, um, has developed a variant of the assay called length extension CrowSeq that can actually revive these samples uh, based on the architecture or based on the enzymatic activity intrinsic to the polymerase. So what we do is we take a degraded sample, we complete the digestion by adding RNases, and then we add back a mixture of biotinylated and non-biotinylated nucleotides to actually run the polymerase on to an average size of 100 to 150 base pairs. And you can see that even in this very old sample, this can extend the RNA that is produced um, and improving mapping. So I think one of the cool, coolest parts of this whole project has been just re recognizing how stable this complex actually is, and this harkens back to lovely work by Don Luce. And here, we can use this property to, to analyze samples using a genomic technique that you really couldn't do with any other tool. So this is cool, and we've used this now to collect data from 20 primary glioblastomas, three PDXs, um, and um, a non-malignant brain sample. And I'm showing you a region near the engrailed Q gene, which you can see is turned on in 80 to 90 percent of glioblastomas. And with this, you can see the activation of these enhancer-like RNAs uh, at the three prime end. 
So you can do basically everything you'd want to do with RNA-seq using this new data type. So here, Qin Yu Chu, who's a fantastic graduate student in my group, uh, has clustered our 20 primary GBMs based on a tissue signature that was, or a rather a gene expression signature that was uh, found using expression microarray data. And it uh, produces four clear clusters, and these correspond beautifully with four subtypes that have been reported using uh, expression data. Um, but you can do a lot of things that you can't necessarily do with a, um, a RNA-based assay as well. So we can define the location of regulatory elements like enhancers and promoters, um, and we can try to discover how those pathways are misregulated in the tumor cell. Um, so to do this, Kini integrated the uh, data that we have collected with uh, ENCODE and Epigenome Roadmap, focusing on DNase1 because it's really high quality and there's a lot of it. And so if you ask for a particular glioblastoma in our cohort, like 1590 here, um, when you see a regulatory element in the tumor, how many other tissues is it DNase1 hypersensitive in? So for example, there's over 6,000 tissues where you have a DNase1 hypersensitive site in every single tissue. And of course, this is constitutively active housekeeping promoters. And I had naively expected to see another uh, goalpost here at zero, which indicates regulatory elements that would be unique to this particular tumor. But we actually don't see that in any of our tumors. Instead, there are a lot of enhancers that are tissue, um, uh, tissue restricted, but these are usually DNA one hypersensitive in at least one other tissue sample. So I'm gonna argue today that this is a useful fingerprint uh, for pulling out information about that particular sample. So Qin Yi developed a way to do this. Um, basically, he developed a score that lets you compare the similarity between any two samples. And this is robust to differences in molecular assays, so it works to compare ProSeq and DNase1Seq data. Um, and it's based on mutual information. So a high score out here indicates a lot of similarity, and a low score indicates lower amount of similarity. So most tissues have some similarity uh, with GM12878 ProSeq data, which I'm using to illustrate that how this works here. Um, and that is reflected in this part of the distribution here, and of course reflects uh, constitutively active promoters. So recall that GM12878 is an Epstein-Barr virus transformed B cell line. Um, so uh, it's perhaps natural to see that immune cells and then primary B cells and then lymphoblastoid cell lines or other Epstein-Barr virus transformed B cells are outliers uh, to this distribution. And then of course, um, we're picking out at the very top of the distribution uh, uh, DNase1-seq data from GM12878 itself. So we're not only getting the right cell type, which is an LCL, but the right genotype within that cell type. So this is very clearly a useful way to um, compare the similarities between any two samples. So with the tool in hand, we ask um, for our primary glioblastomas, what tissue in the data set are they most like? Um, so we, um, there were a few hypotheses that we thought could make sense. So people have been studying three glioblastoma cancer cell lines for a long time. Maybe it looks like that. Or maybe it looks like primary brain cells. And in every single case, we see that the, oh yeah, okay, so here I'm showing mutual information along the y-axis. And in every single case, we see that the primary glioblastomas are similar to a cluster of, uh, of primary brain tissue, normal brain tissue, that represent a cortex. Um, there's lower similarity with brain tissue representing the cerebellum, which makes sense given what we know about where this particular tumor originates. And then there's no more similarity than expected if you draw a cell type at random with those three glioblastoma cell lines. So thinking that this could simply reflect um, contamination in our samples with normal brain tissue, we next took uh, fragments of tumor, primary tumor from a patient, and we implanted them in a mouse uh, to produce a patient-derived xenograft. So in this system, the normal brain sample dies off, and we're left with just the rapidly dividing cell types in the tumor. And in every single case, these recapitulated the signature of enhancers that are unique to the normal brain. So at least in this particular tumor, our conclusion is that the, la the landscape of regulatory sites in the tumor very much recapitulates the tissue of origin, which is uh, quite striking to me. Um, and it may not be surprising. I mean, this is why NCI is retiring their cell lines. But I think there's a really useful property of this, right? So what it means is that um, because they're so similar, the difference is then we can use that to extract information about what's actually driving the malignant behavior of the tumor. So I'd like to take some time to put this in context of what we know about cancer, right? So we know that cancer is originated by these somatic mutations in our DNA sequences. And these either directly or indirectly drive the activity of transcription factors, which drive uh, the transcription of groups of genes which imbue the malignant cells with phenotypic properties that you don't see in the normal tissue. 
And we know a lot about what these mutations are, but we know much less about these transcription factors. And I think there's a good case that can be made um, for understanding what these transcription factors are and, and, um, and in order to understand the mechanisms of, of what is actually driving the cancer. So Rick Young's group wrote a lovely perspective piece last year, which argued that these were dependencies that the tumor has that could be good targets. So this is what we're after, these transcription factors. So to do that, we focused on regulatory elements which are active in the tumor, but were not found in any of the normal brain control samples. Uh, so this is about 12% of the regulatory elements in the tumor, and we call these tumor-associated transcriptional regulatory elements. Um, and um, so next we asked which tissues these were also active in, because remember they're also active in uh, some tissues. So to do this, um, we developed a sampling strategy where we're uh, basically uh, deriving a null distribution for the expected number of similarities um, to a particular tissue. So for example, uh, GBM1590, um, the distribution of sites expected in the fetal brain is right here. And what we actually observe is very, very much enriched in this particular sample. So in this case, this is consistent with models of glioblastoma as a de-differentiation to a more stem-like state. And these uh, fetal uh, brain samples, or any fetal tissue of the neuroectoderm, are very frequently outliers in a lot of our tumors. That's, that's a big group that we see frequently. But it doesn't explain all of this, indicating that there is some heterogeneity here. So to make sense of this, um, next, we clustered um, all of the tissues based on the distribution of regulatory elements in the tissue. Um, and what we see uh, are three, uh, so we treated this as three separate clusters, okay? So this uh, fetal brain uh, was here, um, and this all represents fetal tissue. This represents ES and IPS cells, so we grouped this into a single cluster. Um, we also saw a cluster of immune cells, indicating infiltration with immune cells. And we saw a cluster of differentiated sort of support cells. So for example, astrocytes um, is in this group. Now, I would interpret um, regulatory elements which contribute to each one of these regulatory programs being indicative of the uh, driving the types of, of phenotypes um, that characterize each one of these cell types. Um, so can we identify transcription factors that drive that? Um, and the answer, of course, is yes, we can. Um, so we take an approach much like uh, Robin Dowell's MD scores to find transcription factors which are driving uh, these different regulatory programs. And what we see is there's um, in 80% or more of our tumors independently, we can pick out transcription factors which are involved in the stem-like behavior or the differentiated astrocyte-like behavior, okay? And a couple of these are worth really mentioning. So SOX2 and this POU domain containing transcription factors were validated uh, by Bad, Brad Bernstein's lab a couple of years ago in some really lovely work where they not only validated the importance of this transcription factor, in this particular cancer, but also the importance of those transcription factors in maintaining a stem-like signature that's required for propagation in mouse models in these particular cancers. And it also leaves us with a number of other interesting candidates that we can now go back and validate. So I'll stop there for today. Um, I showed you that CrowSeq works beautifully in anything that we've tried so far, and even in samples that you really couldn't use uh, to analyze using conventional genomic tools. Um, the glioblastoma, um, in the glioblastoma, enhancers largely retain the signature that's associated with the cell of origin, um, but that a small number of new regulatory elements drive uh, fetal-like growth programs. Um, and we can identify the location of transcription factors that are important for this. So thank you to my group, especially to Sun Yi and Ed, who did the work I showed you today. Questions? So um, with the with the CrowSeq, how did you did you do secondary analysis to identify the regulatory elements? Yeah, so we've developed a tool that we call DRAG, or the detection of regulatory elements with CrowSeq. Um, it works with CrowSeq, ProSeq, or ProSeq data, um, and it can pick out the location based on the bidirectional transcription signature um, where these regulatory elements are located. It works well, very well. And so. That can be validated in other studies, like as, so for example, being able to identify clustered enhancers, et cetera, mm -hmm. yeah. in, the, in the same samples using minimal number of cells or tissues? Yeah. Or? 
So we can't go back and validate in these limited tissues, right, because they're, they're limited clinical isolate. But we've done a lot of work where we've gone, um, so we've taken, for example, encode lines, and we've created proseq data in encode lines and called the location of enhancers. And they actually match uh, remarkably well with what people use conventionally as enhancer type assays. So H3K27 acetylation, um, it's, it's a very strong match to that particular mark. Charles, the, uh, it was very fascinating. I was thinking about like, going back to the tissues and the samples. Have you, have you say, uh, taken a single tissue and then sort of like treated it in a, like with a gradient of awfulness to sort of recapitulate what <laughs> right variability that might happen? You know, when you have unique tissues that you can't really say what happened to them. How consistent is the technique? Like, you know, what I'm saying where you have you can control that the sample was the same but you sort of mm -hmm. treated it in increasingly haphazard fashion. Yeah, so we haven't specifically taken tissue and stomped on it on the floor yeah, or yeah, yeah. spit on it or anything yeah. like that. Um, it's a good idea. Um, I can tell you. <laughs> Just, you know, because you can get the variability in the, in the yeah. behavior, so you can sort of have a precision estimate maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, based on the correlations with just pro-seq data, um, and we've collected lots of biological replicates in certain cell yeah, types yeah, yeah. like your cats yeah, yeah. and K562, yeah. um, they're really highly correlated regardless of, of how many times you do the assay, regardless of how many cells you start with. Um, regardless of, I mean, I think the only thing that really adds a lot of variability is if you choose a different time in the growth phase of the cells in culture, which of course changes gene expression anyway. Yeah. So in, in your last slide, when you're identifying the motifs that mm -hmm. give you this fetal growth um, signature, how many factors, I guess we'll back one more, um, how many factors are we talking about? Like is the growth program really only these 12? Um, how many transcription factors need to be activated? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I don't know, I, I mean, we can't choose an upper limit, for example. Um, but we can say that, that roughly, um, uh, I mean, this number of factors consistently comes out regardless of the number of tumors that we use. Um, there's not a lot of other factors that come out in addition to this. Um, so I bet that there's more and that we're underpowered to get them all. Um, but I think this is a good ballpark for, um, for sort of a minimal core program that drives um, a stem-like cell in these particular cancers. And Brad Bernstein's data would be consistent with that, actually. And, and so when you look for the factors that are associated with these motifs, do they routinely get shut down in differentiated tissues? Yeah, so, um, so, so first of all, one, um, to be clear, one limitation with this is we can pick out a motif, we cannot pick out a specific factor based on this analysis, right? So we couldn't tell you which one of these POU domain containing transcription factors actually drives that signal. And probably it's one or a handful. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, um, that's a whole extra step. Um, but fortunately, we have the gene expression signature as well. So we can at least tell you which one is more highly transcribed, say, in the tumor. And in certain cases, like this Hox A9, um, so these, all of these tumors virtually have a huge increase in transcription of, of all four Hox clusters, actually. Um, so it's consistent with an increase in transcription of the Hox gene driving um, then downstream changes to regulatory elements. Okay, let's thank Charles and Alice next speaker.